On tonight's Live with Liverwood, a global corporation tax. Will a cartel of governments destroy tax competition? Can we save free speech on campus? And would Dominic Cummings' approach to government really solve all our political problems? All of that's coming up tonight in the next 60 minutes. <laughs> Kaboom, Kapow! Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Live with Littlewood. Thank you for joining me, Mark Littlewood, Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs, for a free market look at the big issues of the week. Coming up tonight, Dominic Cummings gave his evidence in front of a lengthy seven-hour session of the Health and Social Care and the Science and Technology Select Committees today. But instead of the Whitehall tittle-tattle and who said what when, we'll be asking, do Dom's answers to our political woes have any, well, shortcomings? Meanwhile, are threats to freedom of speech on campus continuing to grow, both in Britain and in the USA? What should be done to give voice to those who feel cowed by wokeism at our universities? Have our lips been sealed or are concerns over freedom of expression sometimes somewhat overblown? That's all coming up a little bit later. But first up, if it wasn't bad enough that they're coming for your right to express yourselves at university, they also seem to be coming for our rights to set our own tax policy. We're calling our first segment tonight the Tax Pact, and we'll be addressing the news that the Biden administration is seeking to impose an effective global minimum corporation tax rate. Didn't we here in the UK just spend five years trying to take back control of our powers to regulate and set economic policy in Westminster? Why is the G7 as desperate to control what we can keep in our wallets as the woke are to determine what we can say on campus? To help me make sense of these issues, I'm delighted to welcome back three fantastic guests to the show. Uh, the IEA's very own Dr. Steve Davies, our head of education here at the IEA. Good evening to you, Steve. How are you? Good, good evening. Good to be here. Uh, Freddie Gray, editor at The Spectator USA. Freddie, thanks very much for joining us. How are you keeping? Very well, Mark. How are you? I'm very good. I'm very, very good. Beer in hand. And um, Matt Kilcoyne, deputy director at the ASI, the Adam Smith Institute, our friends around the corner, uh, back on tonight's show. Matt, a very, very good evening to you. Come on down, Mark. So here we are, gentlemen. The G7 meeting is, is coming up. President Joe Biden's been on manoeuvres trying to convince other nations to impose a sort of worldwide minimum corporation tax rate, starting with the G7 members. Uh, the rate would be, I think, at least 15 percent. That's gone down from 21 percent. Uh, Japan, Canada, France, Germany and Italy. Well, they've, they've shown interest in these ideas, I think you can say, leaving Britain apparently standing alone against the rest of the G7 to defend tax competition. Um, my view is if this was a cartel of private companies trying to fix prices for something across the world, and that's what a tax rate seems to be, uh, the government would intercede. They would call it out for what it was. Freddie, let me start with you uh, from Spectator USA. What's led Biden down this path? And is he going to get somewhere or is this just a sort of virtual signaling around tax avoidance? Well, my view is it is virtually signaling, and I think it's very insincere. Uh, I don't think the Biden administration actually wants to make it happen. I think Ireland's made it clear that uh, it won't allow uh, any kind of uh, global tax. And I don't think Biden uh, wants to mess with the Irish for various reasons. And I think it's, you know, it's obviously it's bigger than that. It's bigger than Ireland. Uh, but I think that the... The general thrust, I mean, the fact that they went down from 21 to 15 with no, without batting an eyelid suggests to me that it's just something that they want to suggest this is something they want to do to the world. And they want to make it clear that their enormous, ridiculous spending that is happening is going to be paid for by something. Uh, and what that something is will be sort of kicked onto the road inevitably until 
the inflationary crisis hits, and it probably is coming. Uh, I don't think this is the answer. I don't think it's ever going to be the answer. I think it's an unrealistic idea. And it reminds me a lot of sort of early climate change talk, you know, where they all said, oh, we're all going to agree about net carbon stuff back in the 90s. And actually, there was never any sincere global agreement on this. It was just a chance for governments to, as you say, virtue signal. But why does Joe Biden need to increase the corporation tax rate in Italy in order to help his mad spending plans in the USA? If he's going on some mad spending plans in the USA, that's a US problem, isn't it? I mean, why? Uh, because well, as you know, the US I, I think, I'm sure you know the answer to this question. Uh, you know, raising the fiscal burden at home is difficult. Uh, it's politically difficult. And I think trying to suggest that you're trying to do something globally uh, for a problem that you probably need to address at home if you want to do all this spending. Um, it's quite an easy political win, or it feels like an easy political win now. Um, I think it will start to unravel pretty quickly. Steve, let me get your take on this. Um, uh, and let me kind of put the case for the defence that it's very easy for companies to avoid corporation taxes. Some would argue they just sort of <clears throat> locate their headquarters nominally in one low jurisdiction area let's say that the low tax area, one low tax jurisdiction, let's say the Republic of Ireland doesn't really do much activity there, but that's formally where they're based, even though they're selling to the big countries of the world or those with lower corporation tax rates. Does corporation tax in today's economy, by its nature, if you like, need to be a global tax? Well, uh, I think in one sense, the answer to that would be yes, uh, if you actually want to have a tax of that kind, because... What has happened is that modern technology has made capital, if you like, companies a lot more nimble. They can do exactly what you describe. And of course, what you find is that sovereign states are competing with each other to offer certain kinds of services to companies to attract those headquarters, as Ireland is doing. Not just low taxes, by the way, but also other things like the rule of law, uh, a stable political system, uh, sometimes good public services and the like. So there's competition going on between sovereign jurisdictions. And the thing is that nowadays, companies which used to be very much fixed and located in one place are increasingly mobile. And it really is very, very difficult to tax them in the way that we currently do as a kind of corporate version of income tax, which is what the Americans actually call their, their equivalent of uh, this tax. And if you do want to make companies pay, that causes a problem for politicians, which is that if you do want to spend like mad, the burden is going to fall upon the relatively less mobile personal taxpayers. Uh, and obviously they're not going to like it. Uh, and so if you do want to tax capital more, you're going to have to find a different kind of tax, one that uh, is more territorially located. So I think that the this is a failed attempt, as well as being virtue signaling, to try and make an existing kind of tax work when I think technology has made it, you know, past its use by date, really. Matt, what's your take on this? Anything to be worried about? I mean, it might be something to be irritated by, but anything to genuinely be worried about? Is it just virtue signaling? Or uh, is this the beginnings of a kind of global jurisdiction over, in this case, one rate of taxation, but God knows where it goes from there? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think Steve's got a really good sort of example there, like understanding the issue in a really holistic way. In the way, it's the fact that, you know, when we talk about a closed economy or an open economy, um, you're, you're talking about a system, what does the tax work within it? Well, actually, most economies are lo linked loops and loops of open economies. So you are actually not just working on one market economy, you're working on across multiple. Um, mm. And it's really interesting to sit there and say that you know co these corporations will pay it because there's no corporation pays the tax, right? In the end, the consumer pays the tax mm. um, or the worker pays the tax through lower wages. And um, and through lower productivity, we all pay, we all pay it from a loss of value. Um, so what the United States is doing, uh, though, with this is, is effectively trying to put, like lose uh, to win on point of principle that there should be some form of ability for sort of states to get involved in other states um, to enforce what is on global norms on tax. Um, and that's a really, really quite large scale departure from the United States history. Obviously, in, 19, in the 1776, we see uh, the United States break away from the UK over a tax dispute. Um, no taxation without representation adorns the cars and houses of many Americans. And they should be infuriated by seeing Janet Yellen telling other countries that they wish to tax what they should be formed, forced to tax without any representation in the US House of Representatives or the Senate. 
and it's the, and that, that's unconstitutional in many respects. And frankly, she should. I, I would suggest that she might need to look at her position um, if that's the position that she wishes to take. Um, I don't think it's got much legs because the thing with cartels is as soon as one person breaks, it all falls apart. Um, the UK of the big countries has already said it's not going to, and it's absolutely right to because the UK's um, overseas territories, which use tax efficient mechanisms in order to attract business, and um, the Cayman Islands, Virgin Islands, Gibraltar, all have economies which are sustainable, health, health, and are well sustained. Unlike many of their peers in the same region, these are places that are prosperous and where we provide, provide a standard of living that is incredible. Um, we, should, we should be encouraging that activity and we should be encouraging the free flow of capital between businesses. That means our way of life, the prosperity and the enjoyment that we have every day um, possible. Instead of like, supporting politicians who have never created wealth in their life, who've never supported a business in their life, um, who just wish to extract rent for the rest of us. Freddie, let me come back to you. You, 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 were, uh, you touched on in your opening remarks the extraordinary spending plans that the Biden administration has. I mean, of course, it was Ronnie Reagan who said a billion here and a billion there. And before you know it, you're talking serious money. But Ronnie Reagan, it pains me to say this, was wrong. We're now talking about a trillion here and a trillion there. A billion yes. really would be a rounding error. Is the federal government continuing to spend and accelerating in this direction more than it can conceivably raise in federal taxation from US taxpayers? I think almost certainly. I mean, I think, you know, going back to Ronald Reagan, uh, you know, I think he was a great president, but he wasn't fiscally responsible. And there hasn't really been a fiscally responsible uh, president for quite some time. I mean, Bill Clinton sort of flirted with it and then didn't. But I mean, now you, you had uh, Trump was not fiscally responsible at all. Uh, and now you have Biden coming in. And the amazing thing is there's no opposition to this. There's no Republican opposition to the idea. I mean, they're, they're talking about 800 billion rather than 2 trillion on one mm -hmm. of the bills, right? But then you then got several other bills north of a trillion dollars. Um, and there is no political capital, it seems, in saying this is insanity, because since 2008, uh, the argument for fiscal sanity seems to have gone. Uh, modern monetary theory uh, mm -hmm. suggests that it will not have inflationary consequences. We'll have to see about that. At the moment, that's not looking like a particularly good argument, uh, but we'll see. And I think Biden buys into, you know, Stephanie Kelton, I think she's called as one of his advisors, or one of Yellen's advisors on this. Uh, is this idea that you know the, the idea of deficit is a myth? You know, any, any debt-related problems are mythical. The world has changed. Labour markets have changed, and the government can keep throwing in liquidity into the financial system. Uh, it, it seems to me that Biden has no incentive to stop at the moment, uh, and and this is the easy part of his political equation. This is the part of the equation where he can give people stimulus. He can say, I want to protect jobs. I can, he can do all this stuff now. Uh, at some point, he's going to have to do the difficult stuff, which is raising capital. Yeah. And the one time he but, tried but to Freddie, do it, was suggested. Mm. Sorry. Freddie, help, help me here. I mean, I, I don't buy any of this, but if the argument goes that um, uh, it doesn't matter how big the debt or the deficit is, why stop at two trillion? I mean, that's a bit, that's a bit sort of, you know, mean spirited, isn't it? If you can spend effectively an infinite amount of money, why not spend, you know, five trillion, ten trillion, a hundred trillion? That's where the theory surely falls down, right? Well, I mean, those who are arguing. Well, indeed, I think even even in, even in the back of their minds, uh, even in the back of sort of the, the Stephanie Kelton minds, there, there must be some concept that you need. Uh, some kind of fiscal sanity. So at some point, somebody's going to have to say, you can't keep doing this. And and as I, I've said in a few debates with Americans recently, somebody would have thought of this before, right? <laughs> if you could just spend your well, way did. out of everything. Well, uh, yeah. Somebody would have agreed that this was a good idea and a good thing to do. But it's been tried. It's failed. They got away with it to a certain extent in 2008. I, you know, we can argue about the warping effects it had on the economy elsewhere. But that was a freak. Otherwise, it's always a disaster and it always will be. Steve, let me come back to you. What's your thoughts on that, both the theory of it? I mean, why, you know, if deficits don't matter, let, let them be infinite. But also on Freddie's point, why amongst um, politicians of all stripes on both sides of the Atlantic, doesn't this seem to sort of be an issue that taxes are going up and spending's going through the roof? So is there... Is my um, uh, reducto ad absurdum correct <laughs> on, on, on modern monetary theory? 
And, uh, and what, why doesn't anybody agree with the four of us in any meaningful political party? Well, actually, to be fair to them, the MMT people, uh, they don't say that you can just spend without limits. Their argument is that you can create money, print money, basically, up to the point where you start to get inflation. Uh, and th then they're thinking that is then the signal that you've hit the natural limits of the productivity of the economy and you need to pull back. Uh, and the, kind of the unspoken assumption that they all have is that there's an awful lot of slack in the economy, that there's an enormous like output gap, basically. Mm -hmm. Now, we're undergoing at the moment a natural experiment, and we will find out pretty soon just how much of an output gap there is, because it's almost impossible, in fact, to uh, know in advance just how much there is. The problem with MMT is that basically, if you run your budget on that basis, it's like driving a car really, really fast uh, in reverse with your black window blacked out. You know, you don't know when you've hit the wall until you do, if you basically. So it's a very high risk enterprise. Then why are the politicians going along with it? Well, I think for two reasons. One is this means they can give out goodies to voters. Um, without having to put taxes up, which, of course, you know, they like because it makes them popular in the short term. But also, I think, because the alternative is really unpleasant for them. And the alternative is taking some really tough decisions about what government does, exactly how extensive it is, and how you deal with things like the enormous overhang of liabilities that governments have built up by making all kinds of promises to people like me, basically, people of my age, not you know, young chaps like you, uh, and they don't want to confront that. And this is a way of dodging the uh, responsibility. I do think it means something, though, that this move for a global corporation tax is not... The politics of it are about making companies pay their share. But I think there's actually another motive for it, which Matt uh, sort of alluded to, which is it's about getting control of capital. Because these so-called tax havens, what they actually are is the plumbing of the world investment system. They are, you know, money in tax havens is not sitting in a bank, as people say, it's being invested. And so essentially, they're the mechanism by which capital flows around the world to destinations that private investors choose. And the politicians don't like that. They want to control where the capital goes. Mm -hmm. And the American politicians want to control companies because they think of them, companies like Google, for example, as being their companies. Mm -hmm. And so they want to bring them under more political control. And that actually, I'm afraid, is not a new thing in American history. That's uh, this is just straight Alexander Hamilton. It, it's... Uh, you know, been part of American politics since the founding. Matt, Matt, where do you think this is going to end up? And again, I, we, we can question how much we should be worried about it. I mean, I would have thought it's more headline grabbing than real, right? Because, I mean, even if you had agreed amongst the G7 a floor on corporation tax, even if you then applied it to the OECD, even if you then applied it to the whole of planet Earth, There'd be all sorts of carve outs and, and loopholes nationally, right? You'd be able to say, all oh, right, well, the corporation tax rate is technically 100 percent or 50 percent. But yeah. here's a million different ways where you can avoid corporation tax by paying out to this or into this scheme or investment. We already do that, of course, as well. Right. Like, you know, part of the super deductibility that we added last year, which we're supportive of because you want to tax investments less. Uh, than current consumption um we like that's actually now really just a, a way of doing a, a corporation tax cut like or increase sorry later but you say that you've cut this tax now it's a very convoluted way of uh, of um moving the money on a balance sheet between years um the, the, if the president if the president of the united states wants to look at uh, corporation tax or he wants to look at loopholes then he should look to his own state of delaware because that is the tax haven like center of the world. It has more, it is an incredible jurisdiction with all yeah. kinds of loopholes and carve outs, most of which he's overseen in some regard in his position, he, or he's overlooked perhaps, we should start to say rather than overseen. Um, not, not only that, if I can interrupt, not only that, he was generously supported by the credit card industry throughout the yeah. 90s because he was yeah. from Delaware. Exactly. Uh, so exactly. Sorry, and that's actually, in America, the problem, as Steve mentioned very quickly, is like, actually, they are linked. The general um, electric and, and GM motors and so on are associated with the American brand. That egalitarian ability to get the same good, no matter where you are, no matter what, for the same price, is an American concept. And it worked incredibly well for a lot of people. Consumer, consumers have benefited massively from it. In the UK, there's a bit of more of a, of a separation. 
between well church and state is a, a little bit more entangled but um in, in terms of like doing business there was always a distrust between the landowners and the industrialists that was never properly married into the party that are, that are governing uh, the labor party obviously has its with its trade union roots so a distrust with business but the tories and uh the between estate owners and industrialists are a little bit at loggerheads too um and that's the same replicated right across europe so there's no um, no quite equivalent to the same level. And it, that's a real problem for America, is that it doesn't understand the European culture on that. It doesn't understand the British culture on that. And it is in trying to impose an American way of doing tax and also politics that is going to come up with real problems in the real world. Um, Freddie, coming back to you, you, you were bemoaning, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to press Steve on the point again. He answered my first question very eloquently, um, but I'm going to press him on the second. Where are the tax cutters these days? Oh, yeah. I mean, if they're not in... Uh, if, if they're not the, uh, you mentioned that the, the GOP proposals are still eye-wateringly expensive, just not quite as crucifyingly expensive as those of the Democrats. Is this a reflection of a detached political elite, Freddie, or is it actually a reflection of the electorate? Or do you actually find in the electorate, you know, ordinary uh, American folk on the electoral roll are craving tax cuts? It's just they now no longer have any politicians in any party that are sort of representing those get spending down, get my income tax down type Reaganite uh, meme? Well, it's a, it's a really interesting question because, of course, the Tea Party back in 2010 was a, was a sort of tax revolt. Uh, and that was a, gra a grassroots Republican movement that, that sort of did ferment the Trump movement. But now, surveys suggest, polls suggest that the that, Trump people are not interested in that, and they think that tax cutting, tax cutting has become associated with the, the sort of vile Iraq war, Bush era, evil Republican Party that they don't want anything to do with, and that has tried to crush them repeatedly. So I, I think there is, there are sort of voices of fiscal sanity in the Republican Party, but it has to be done very sotto voce. Uh, you know, uh, people like Marco Rubio won't, won't sort of say it out loud anymore. Um, it, it has to be presented in a, in a different way. I think what might happen, though, is the electric, electorate are notoriously fickle. And if, uh, if Biden's um, inflationary policies start to really hurt America, you will find America rediscovering uh, its uh, fondness for low, low taxation and uh, real money quite quickly, I think. Mm. Steve, where are they, the classical liberal tax cutters. I mean, there's the four of us on the Live and Littlewood mm. YouTube channel. Is that it on both sides of the pond, pretty much? No, I, I think there are plenty of people around who support the idea of tax cuts. The problem is, I think, as Freddie said, the, the electorate has moved away from that at the moment. Uh, and I think there's two reasons for that. One is that uh, the electorate has basically, well, they, they do, they would like to pay less tax, I think, but they think that this will lead to less money being spent on public services and they still want the high levels of public spending. And so uh, they may not favour raising taxes uh, on themselves, all in favour of raising taxes on the people, but they also want high levels of public spending. And that makes it a very hard climate for people who want to reduce the amount of money the state takes. The other thing I think, though, is more subtle, and that is that taxes are associated with nationalism. Uh, it's associated with the idea that you're a citizen of a, a national political entity and you're putting money into the kind of collective pot that we all share. And I think that, that there's been a big upsurge of nationalism um, on particularly the political right, like the Trumpists that uh, Freddie mentioned. And for them, therefore, cutting taxes is a means of giving away control of what is really a collective budget mm. to a globally rootless cosmopolitan class and big corporations. Now, that's a very, you know, the only way to rebut that argument uh, from a liberal point of view is to argue the case for individualism and to say that basically, you know, what it is, should be about is about individual self-determination. But that's what we're up against. It's not so much socialism as such or social democracy. It's the national collectivism that is driving a lot of the support for higher taxes at the moment, or at least not reducing them. Matt, do you buy that analysis? It's... You know, no, I think it's a really interesting analysis. I think it's really interesting in terms of like the, the in America, in North America, there are two countries, right? Obviously, you've got different nations underneath America, but you've got like uh, Canada and the USA are like by definition kind of yin and yang to one another. And a lot of nationalism in America is associated with the American right. And because of that, and because of Canada's size compared to America, a lot of the politics is about not being American. 
And therefore, the nationalism in Canada is much more associated with left-wing movements, but not just, not just Quebec, but also the Liberals, um, to support like their version of the NHS, which is the only system in the world which is like the NHS, um, is like is the B Canadian. Um, and it's a lot of the sort of like so I, you know, I wonder, therefore, Steve, I like there are two like you know I can wait, I can outweigh the, the the failures of state pen of state spending because I know that in ten years time the credit card will will run out and you know our ideology very much still there. However, um, in terms of the politics, there are two ways it could it could go right. Left libertarians um, or some f emerge maybe out of some some left wing groups that go actually we don't want to be controlled by the center. We want to control our own budgets smaller and smaller, but we still want collective budgets and collective spending. Or um, it will come out of the right, and that will be. But I think it's the left one that I think is most interesting because it will be how the Democrats respond to their hegemony on these issues, but also the threat to their hegemony from the right, and they could be wholesale taken by the right uh, in an election that would be much more devastating to their projects and their plans um, than if they come up with a coherent narrative against it in themselves. Uh, just before we move on to our uh, next topic, let me ask each of you because this is a, a continual. Well, I'm not sure it's a refrain or a theory of mine, but do we think we are we are reaching or have reached the taxable limits of the economy? I, I'm particularly interested mm. in the UK, but the, the sort of history over my lifetime is that no government, be it of a, whatever political persuasion or with a big majority or a small majority or whatever mix of taxes they've tried, seems to be able to squeeze more than about 38%, maybe 39% of national income mm. in tax. That's about the most you can conceivably get. Whatever you try, top rates of 83% of income tax or top rates of 40, VAT at 20 or at 5%, I think it's been as low as. Um, so whatever you try, this is the most you can squeeze out of the, the system. Steve, do you think we have reached the taxable limits and the, these sort of proposals for a global floor on corporation tax or a, a realisation of that? Yes, I do think that, on both counts. Um, and it's not just us. I think most countries in the OECD are at their national tax limits, which vary from one country to another. So in France, it appears to be about 50%, and uh, as you say, about 38 40% in the UK, people there in the US. Um, and so the politicians are in a pickle, uh, because they've got these huge built-up liabilities, but they're finding they can't squeeze any more blood out of the stone, basically. Uh, and so now they're scratching around for another way of dealing with this. Freddie, taxes in the US are a little lower than in the UK. Of course, it's important to remember your federal system, the federal system over there, because, you know, most of our taxes come to us from the national government, whereas you've got a lot of state taxes and the rest of it. But is there any sense amongst tax cutters or free market thinkers in America at this point that actually, whatever the ideology of it, you probably can't squeeze much more out of the private sector? Or is there, if the Social Democrats continue to prevail, a a way of getting more in corporation tax, income tax, sales tax, whatever it might be. I'm afraid I'm, I'm pretty gloomy about this, uh, having spoken to a lot of Americans about it. And I, I think we are reaching the stage where the kind of a lot of the electorate, or certainly uh, the part of the electorate that expresses itself most regularly in public, uh, are at such a level of entitlement now. We are living in the ultimate age of entitlement where uh, people do expect to have massive government spending and expect not to pay money as mm. well, not yeah, to right. pay taxes. And, and I think this is an unsustainable thing politically. Uh, and unfortunately, I think, you know, the left provides the easiest answers in the short term. And so I suspect, you know, that the, the, left, the left wing of the Democrats are going to succeed in the short term. Matt, what's your take? I think thinking through the logic of that, um, you've, well, at first I had a paper idea, and I was sat there going, like, if the upper limit is 38%, if that's a demonstrable, you've, you've visible and observable fact, um, then what you actually want from that is to have experimentation underneath of lots of different types of tax so that you can see what creates productive economic output. Mm. Um, and so the, the, the Democrats' answer to then siphon off and demand the people that is, is actually very counterproductive to getting a productive economy. So that should be the right answer. If that's an observable fact, firstly, we should observe it. And secondly, that we should then be trying to have experiments underneath in as many places as possible to work yeah. out what's going to create the best economy for all of us. OK, st stay with us, uh, gentlemen. We've talked about the the state or the or even the G7, the, the, the global uh, networks of states getting more into our wallets. I want to move on to the extent to which 
uh, the opinions we express with our own voice are being controlled. We're calling our next section, Our Lips Are Sealed. Um, the big state isn't just trying to control tax revenues, but our freedom of expression. Um, despite some helpful signs, some, some hopeful signs, I would say, on, on this side of the pond in some of the fight back against um, freedom of expression uh, not being a particularly easy thing to do. I think, I feel, I sense far worse than in my youth. Um, uh, we, we, we still have a big, big, we have a big, big problem here, despite these fight backs. Now today, and um, Steve, I'm going to ask you to explain your paper in a moment. I'll come to Matt and Freddie for their thoughts. Today, the IA has released a new paper by Steve, arguing about what we need to do specifically in the higher education sector mm. in order to encourage a wider range of institutions to compete and arguing that this would help solve the uh, free speech problem. If you had, for example, much clearer whether you were going to Snowflake University or Sound University, you can pick and choose, but they're all sort of a bit identical. I'm going to come to Steve yeah. in a moment to hear his thesis. But, Freddie, what, what do you make of the, the state of play of freedom of speech specifically in the university sector on on the US side of the pond? Is it, is it a crushing problem there? Or is it just a sort think, of spasm of wokeism that's now being dealt with? No, I think, I'm afraid, I think it's much more deep. Now we're getting to the phase where the universities are so mad, uh, or lots of campuses in America are so mad, it's all, it, it just feels like a tired right-wing talking point to talk about them, but it, it is... Deep, a deep, deep insanity has set in for about 40 years, and it's just getting madder and madder every generation. But, but, or every, you know, it's lots of students that leaves university. I think the real danger now, and you see this in the UK, is that it's becoming, these students have graduated, and they are now in the institutions, they're now in the corporations, they're now in the media too, and they're now in politics. And you have uh, a sort of, I don't like to use the word woke, I'd be trying not to use the word woke, but you, you know, I can't stop myself from doing it in this instance. You, you have a sort of hyper woke, uh, increasingly hyper woke generations passing through institutions like corporations, the media, and it's all coming from higher education because it's an elite status signifier, if nothing else, to have a very, very odd what what twenty years ago would have been considered very, very odd views about identity politics and so on. And now that's a way of showing that you want to get on in the world, that you're a smart person. Pretty grim. Matt, Matt what's, your, what's your read before I say uh, goodnight to you at the, the state of freedom of speech here in the UK, particularly on campuses, where I know that the Adam Smith Institute, like ourselves, does a lot of work with, with students at universities? Um, I think at university, that there is a relatively robust level of, of debate. Um, I find the bureaucracy in touch to it um, unedifying, and it does shut down debate from happening in the first place. They then say nobody was deplatformed. That's not true. You just didn't give them a platform in the first place. That's and that's, that's the problem. Um, I do think though that like things like um, woke is a relatively useful term because uh, basically it just means um, a, a four letter word of a person that you don't particularly like. Uh, and yeah. so and people <laughs> therefore associate whatever it is that they have with the thing that they don't like. And that's great because then you just go, no, I don't like it. And that's actually relatively good for the right to have like a term that they can use, like gammon is used on the left and so on. Um, and we shouldn't be ashamed of using such terms just because they don't like them. I think that, and that shows, by the way, that our freedom of speech is relatively quite high. We can still get away with, with cat calling. And that's a very, it's a very elite woke gammon opinion of you there, Matt. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, or on that, uh, only that mild semantic disagreement between uh, Freddie and Matt. Matt, Freddie, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Always lovely to see you. I hope to catch up with you again soon. Steve, stay with us. And I'm going to introduce uh, two more guests with their, their thoughts on uh, are our lips sealed forcibly uh, or, or not. Uh, so warm welcome back to um, Emma Webb, Deputy Research Director at the Free Speech Union. Lovely to have you uh, back with us, Emma. How are you this evening? Good. Good, good. I've good. been very much enjoying uh, all of the uh, stuff out of Westminster today. Oh, yeah, that's been a bundle of fun. And um, and Joe Williams, founder of the Keo Think Tank. Uh, how are you, Joe? Lovely to have you with us. Hello. Great to be here. Thank you. Um, so, Joe and Emma, I'll come to you shortly. But, Steve, perhaps you can say a little about what's in your paper. We'll, we'll <clears> link to it in the show note in the chats. My, uh, I haven't read it cover to cover yet, but my understanding is this. You say that there are real free speech problems at universities. They can be overstated, 
they're generally restricted to the more elite institutions. Mm. This is some way a reversion to the normal as universities have historically actually been committed to defending orthodoxy rather than instead, instead of supporting freedom. The state, you argue, shouldn't get involved in forcing mm. freedom of speech on, on uh, university campuses. This is sort of the government's plan at the moment to have sort of free speech czars yeah. or some such like. But instead, what you really need to do is to tackle it at root, reform the funding model, um, uh, repeal some regulation to allow a much wider range of options within the sector. Is that a fair summary? Perhaps you can flesh that out for us a bit, Steve. Yeah, th th that is a fair summary. I mean, the, the historical background is that um, for most of human history, the idea that you should have free speech and discussion is a big heresy. And to believe that is to get yourself into serious trouble uh, because powerful people have never liked that. And universities historically in Europe were certainly about pursuing the truth. But the thing was that there was understood to be a known truth. Now, the problem was historically that people disagreed about what that known truth was. So the truth depended on whether you were in a Catholic or a Protestant state, for example. Uh, but then in the 19th century, what lots of liberal campaigners and radical campaigners did was to create the modern academy, which is dedicated to the idea of competing views, debating in, with each other and uh, discovering through a process of trial and error and argumentation what was you know, going to be the most true or uh, least wrong, perhaps, uh, way of thinking about things. Now, is this under threat? Well, I think, yes, it is, but not in the way that a lot of people suppose. So you do get these high profile cases of speakers being disrupted, or other people being uh, barred from speaking, deplatformed, and things like that. But these, I think, are A, not as common as people imagine. And one of the reasons why they get so much publicity is A, because they're rare, and B, because a lot of people object. There's a lot of pushback. So it isn't the case of people not, you know, just simply rolling over. And uh, th those also, um, there's, universities are private bodies and they have a perfect right to disinvite people or private societies within them have a right to do that if they want to do so. Uh, that's, that's up to them. And I think that having the state impose duties or obligations upon universities to provide platforms for people regardless of whether they want to or not is actually a classic case of a cure that is worse than the disease, basically. Uh, that, in my view, is going to cause all sorts of problems down the line. And it gives the state a degree of power and control over institutions of learning that we just shouldn't, shouldn't go have or tolerate. But on the other hand, I do think that what you find in universities is a more general problem, which is that there's a uniformity of opinion. It is the case that most academics across the board in most institutions of higher education espouse broadly the same view, set of views. And those views are also increasingly dominant in publishing, the media, politics, the senior management levels of large corporations, the HR departments of large corporations, things of that sort. And that's a much wider and bigger problem and it's a lack of pluralism and a lack of diversity at an institutional level that i think we need to worry about more than anything else and my final point really is where does this come from and i think it comes from uh, it is an elite phenomenon um and the reason why this is alarming to people like say freddie who was with us a moment ago is that uh it's the elite who tend to set the tone for society a lot of other people tend to think oh you know if this is what the important people uh, think I should follow them. Conversely, if they don't, then you get the kind of situation you had in the Soviet Union, where there's a lot of disgruntled and resentful people um, who dislike uh, the fact that they're obliged to parrot a party line that they know is bollocks, basically, uh, which is ultimately bad for the elites. Why are they doing this then? Well, I think it's because um, there's a a uh, growing problem of elite overproduction. We are producing way too many people who are qualified for an increasingly small number of elite positions in academia, the media, politics, senior management, professional jobs and the like. And this is a lot of this, what's going on at the moment, I think, is about a way of uh, intra-elite competition. It's sending a signal that you are a more meritorious person than the other because your adherence to the orthodoxy, the consensus, is more pure and hard line. It's a phenomenon you see constantly in religious sects and cults, actually. It leads to what is known technically as a purity spiral. And I think that that's what we're seeing in wider society. So I don't think there's a particularly severe problem of attacks on free speech universities, except insofar as that's the most visible sign of a wider problem of attempts to 
uh, if you like, enforce a kind of consensus or orthodoxy which is held by the elite. Really interesting. Um, Emma, what's your take? You've described free speech, the kind of state of free speech as being the equivalent of the canary in the coal mine of, you know, where society's going to go. What, what, what's your audit of the health of the canary at the moment? I mean, <laughs> choking a bit, chirping or dead in its own cage? Well, I agree with some of uh, the diagnosis of what's just been said, but not entirely. Um, so the Free Speech Union has had over 100 cases of um, people coming to us, members, with uh, issues to do with free speech in universities, uh, academics and students. Uh, and these, I think... To downplay it is a mistake because a lot of the cases that happen are not in the public domain um, and they're not just limited to instances of people being no platformed, but students who get put through these horribly traumatic disciplinary processes that can seriously adversely affect their career, um, their, their studies. And we've seen this recent case at Abate University of a final year law student um, who expressed some gender critical views and is now facing um, um, a disciplinary procedure which could see her expelled from the university before getting her degree. Um, so I think for, if for a start it's very wrong to downplay the seriousness of what's going on. But I also think that um, there is a different way to look at this which is that this this is not an extraneous duty that's being imposed on universities but something that is core to the purpose of a university that they in order to function they require academic freedom and free speech that's something that is absolutely core to their purpose and so actually the idea of people having rights and those rights needing remedy when they're um, trampled mm -hmm. upon by institutions like universities is important and so I think what the what what the and, I, and the FSU has welcomed this um, higher education free speech bill specifically because it would create a deterrent effect um, that would give us tools to deal with a lot of the cases that we see from our members. And so I think the most important thing to say is that uh, we shouldn't downplay the severity of what is going on in our universities and particularly because it's something that is core to their functioning. Joanna, let me come to you. You published uh, your own essay uh, this week on the state of academic freedom. And I think you, you've argued there's a way to combine cultural change at universities with some sort of changes in the law brought about by government. Tell us what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the first point I, I'd like to make at risk of sounding, uh, so you seem to bring out the uh, negative in me, Mark. I don't know quite why. I always come on the show and uh, risk. We're here to cheer you up. Joanna, we're, we're, not, we're, not supposed, we're not here to depress you. <laughs> I think the, the main point I wanted to make in my essay is that we uh, shouldn't, and, and this is where I really agree with Emma, we, we shouldn't be underestimating the scale of the problems that we're facing. Um, I, I think on, on the no platforming, yes, there are a very few examples of um, real no platforming that we've seen. But I think the problem is partly, as Emma says, you know, this is the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more cases that don't get that much publicity. But I think even more fundamentally than that, um, these cases send out a message to other people on university campuses. They say, if you speak out, if you say something even remotely controversial, such as a woman has a vagina I mean how controversial is that if you say something even remotely controversial this is what will happen to you and I think that's what's so dangerous about those cases and I actually think this is exactly um, what causes this uniformity of, of intellectual thought which you're you're getting at so I think we really shouldn't underestimate the scale of a problem my my concern is that it, this has gone beyond both cultural change and legal change and so we kind of need to push in both directions obviously we need to keep on making the case for political and cultural change i think some of the legal uh, reassertions of the importance of free speech on campus are really to be welcomed um, but the danger is of course it just adds an in, in an additional layer of bureaucracy and that universities find a way around it they create these free speech codes which are actually about defining the parameters mm. of what can and can't be said. So I think we just have to be really vigilant. Uh, Emma, let me come back to you with, with, with if you like, the, the, the challenge that 
classical liberals or in Steve's um, research paper that we released today. I mean, how much does it matter? I appreciate there are extreme examples uh, of people saying things that you might consider, an ordinary person might consider innocuous that lands them in trouble. But what would your take be, Emma, or that of the Free Speech Union about, I don't know, let's hypothesize, uh, a Christian university that says, actually, we, we believe in creationism. We, we, don't, we don't teach Darwinism. You come here if you're interested in creationism and there's lots of classes about the Bible. Not so many um, from Richard Dawkins or about the Koran or about uh, Charles Darwin or the socialist LGBT university of wherever that says, uh, actually, our mission and our take on the world is this. Uh, and you might imagine that these universities would then have quite strict codes about who they platform, who they don't. I mean, it would be transparent, right? It wouldn't be that you found out you committed a crime afterwards. I've often confessed I do this myself at the IEA. My staff at the IEA had their free speech um, in some ways trammeled by their contracts of employment, right? There are things they cannot say that, and there are certain things an IEA staff member could do for which I would fire them, uh, even if it was an expression of a freedom of speech. What would be wrong, Emma, do you think with, if I've understand Steve's pre prescription correctly, that you, you just have a kind of massive diversity of different universities and you know if you're um, wanting to make the rather innocuous remark that women have vaginas but there are some universities that will expel you for making that innocuous remark well go to another one yeah i i think it's a bit too hypothetical because maybe in the us you you might be able to sort of speculate about that kind of thing i think it's very unlikely that we would um have that sort of situation in the uk where the universities are I, can, I mean, I can think of a handful of universities maybe that sort of function in, in that sort of very sort of private sort of specific, they have a very sort of specific identity, maybe a university like Buckingham perhaps. Um, but generally speaking, you know, that's not the way that universities function in this country. And I think that, and this is my personal opinion, I think that Joanna makes a really important point there um, that just because we have this uh, bill being proposed if this bill were to be passed and to become legislation that doesn't mean that we can sort of sit on our laurels and that we don't therefore have to make the, the argument for free speech and so I think rather than sort of hypothetical um, examples and, and I know that this is obviously um, we're trying to, to sort of uh, go back to a libertarian point about the, the the fact that these institutions are in some way private but I think that their function within society is much more than that um, and so I'm not really coming at it from a libertarian point perspective personally but I think that the point that Joanna makes is a really important one which is that even if this legislation were to come in, that's not the silver bullet. That that deals with, um, gives us tools to challenge uh, institutions when they uh, discriminate against people on the basis of their beliefs and on the basis of their um, their speech or views that they might express in in lectures or on university campus or even on on social media. It it, it provides us with an ability to remedy people who get uh, against people who, when universities discriminate against students staff um visiting speakers and so on but it it although it does uh it does give a duty to uni it would give a duty to universities to have to promote uh an environment of free speech that might be in its sort of philosophical ethos or um its ethical ethos i think we still have to keep making the argument for freedom of speech and i think that all of us I imagine would probably agree that that is something that should be fought for in any university, regardless of whether you're thinking about universities being these sort of private organisations or whether they have a particular, um, I mean, Ox Oxford University is a good example of this, that they have some colleges that are um, some colleges that are uh, Catholic, some that are Anglican. Um, it's the same with UCL and KCL. KCL was originally uh, an Anglican institution, whereas UCL was a secular institution. These institutions have these backgrounds, but we wouldn't say that that is a reason for them to discriminate. And actually, um, as in the case of Oxford University, that's been quite good uh, generally in, in standing up for freedom of speech. Um, that isn't a reason for discriminating against people. And I don't think any of us would argue that it is. Steve, what, very briefly, Steve, what, what to Emma's point that uh, 
you're, you're sort of wanting to have your cake and eat it. On the one hand, you're arguing that what you would love to see is a sort of, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, lots of different universities, you know, Snowflake University can compete with Sound University. But actually what you've got in what should be, whether it's public or private, a relatively competitive market is a herding instinct. Everybody's basically morphed towards groupthink. It's quite difficult to tease out, I don't know, what the difference is between Newcastle University and Leicester University in any meaningful way. Everything's herded together. Do we simply just not have the capacity to have the wide variation of, you know, I, you know, let, you might have IEA University and Adam Smith Institute University in an extreme case, but we don't even seem to have got much beyond sort of, as Emma says, whether the legacy back in the day was Catholic or, or Protestant or neither. I think you might be on mute, Steve. I think, yeah, I think Emma's point is well taken. Uh, that is where we are now. Uh, what I would say is that um, one of the bad things about that is precisely that it then leads to quite understandable demands for public regulation of these institutions as being things that serve a public purpose, which I think is very, very dangerous. Now, I think really in the longer term, what we need to do is to recreate a much more diverse uh, ecology, if you will, of public discussion in which universities don't have the overwhelmingly dominant role that they do now. What we do in the shorter term, I think, is simply to keep up the fight, to push back against people who are trying to impose uh, a single monopoly of views. And I would add very quickly here that this is not a left versus right matter. Uh, there's all kinds of views that are getting, uh, you know, pushback and uh, attempts to send them at the moment. Like, so Julie Bendel, for example, about as left wing as you can get, uh, is finding herself constantly deplatformed or barred from places now because of her views about transsexuality, being, her being a, a radical feminist. There's a guy called Ugo Bardi, who's a very well-known environmentalist, who's just been banned from Facebook because he's sceptical about the hydrogen economy. Now, you know, uh, it, it's a kind of, there's a much, it, this isn't simply a matter of people with conservative or classical liberal views having a hard time. It's actually becoming much wider than that. It's getting to the point where um, unless you hew to a narrow orthodoxy, you get serious pushback. Uh, and I would add, by the way, that the kind of disciplinary cases that are mentioned, I think that arises mainly because university administrators are scared out of their minds by the fear of lawsuits. This is all about trying to prevent legal right. complaints and lawsuits being brought against them in the courts. That's the main problem there. Um, Joanna, before we move on to our la last topic, let me just come back to you with your thoughts. Peter Gill points out in the chat, thank you, Peter, I always learn something from him, uh, each episode. Newcastle University used to be King's College Durham University. Paul Perrin says in the chat, what's the point of free speech in university if the IA, for example, would re refuse to employ you for something you said after you graduate. So you might not get kicked out of university, but you can't get a job because all we do now is to go through people's Twitter feeds and work out whether they've said something unsound or untoward at any point in the last 15 years. And if so, it's career death. What do you make of that, Joanna? <laughs> well, I think in this discussion about cultural change, I think we need to go even more back to basics and we actually need to think what's the point of a university, what's the whole yeah. purpose of having a higher education institution. Exactly. And to my mind, if if something if an institution is not concerned with the pursuit of knowledge, if it's not concerned with how to get closer to truth, and for me, that's the crucial importance of academic freedom. It's about allowing contested ideas uh, to play out in a marketplace um, of a, a, a physical campus. Um, that that's the whole purpose of it. And if it, if you have a woke university, for example, of a snowflake university, to me that would be um, a contradiction in terms. It wouldn't be a university. It would be a seminary. You know, it would it would be uh, an indoctrination camp. The conclusions are being determined in advance and therefore it's not uh, an institution concerned with the pursuit of knowledge. It's an it's an institution concerned with indoctrinating students into a particular um, world view. And so it doesn't deserve the name university. I think it's really interesting that Buckingham University, our only private university, which I think very definitely does deserve the name university, um, actually tops Spikes free speech university rankings every single year that we ran them. Um, 
And I think the thing to to come back to, perhaps, Stephen, what you're saying that, that is interesting to tease out in the way we operate higher education in this country is the role of, of public funding. Yep. And to my mind, I would very much link public funding with um, the pursuit of knowledge. And when mm. universities yep. beyond that, I would take the name away from them and I would take public funding away from them. Really interesting. I want to move on to our last topic. And I know, Steve, you need to leave us in, in, in just a few minutes. I know a lot of people have been mentioning it in the, the chat. Uh, we couldn't uh, leave today's show without having something to say about the, um, the figure, the man, the myth that is Dominic Cummings. Um, he's, of course, given, if you watch the full box set, I think it's about six episodes over seven hours of of evidence that he, he he gave today in front of a, a joint select committee hearing. I'm really interested in picking your guys' brains about um, not so much what he said about who said what when, uh, who did what, who. Mm. Um, uh, I mean, he, he clearly took the Secretary of State for Health. Um, I, I saw this observation on the Guido Fawkes website, threw him under the bus and then reversed. Um, uh, but without sort of working out the, the political potential fallout from this. What is Cummingsism? What is his philosophy? We're calling this section shortcomings um, because I listened to much of his evidence today. It was distracting me a lot from work, I have to admit. It was compelling viewing for uh, political nerds. And he, he's a very, very articulate man. He's not, he's not a close friend of mine, but I've met him on a, a number of occasions. And he, he's quite an impressive figure. But Here's my issue, and this came out quite a lot in the testimony that he gave today. He was trying to basically put people who work in government into either the idiot side of the ledger or the genius side of the ledger. It, it, he, he was rather, unusually for him, quite self-effacing. He did say that he was surprised that somebody with his very limited ability and knowledge could rise so high in politics. But And I forget all the names now, but he was particularly commending this person who was brought in to do the data science genius of a man, one of the most intelligent people on the planet, uh, and then uh, giving uh, eviscerating analyses, particularly of politicians. I'm not sure if, whether they were civil servants or not. Now, Steve, before I let you go, and then I'll ask uh, Emma and Joanna's uh, view, uh, is Dom, Dom Cummings basically a central planner? He just thinks that the people sat around the central planning table aren't smart enough or knowledgeable enough that the real problem is not rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, it's who sits in those deck chairs. And if only he could recruit his platoon of highly intelligent astrophysicists and data programmers, the state would work like a dream. That seems to me, actually, increasingly, having often thought of him as being somebody on the broadly liberal centre-right, that's what Cummingsism is, isn't it? Uh, I think, yes, pretty much. Um, what he is, he's not a, he is a central planner of a sort, I think, uh, or actually to be more precise, he's a would-be project manager because he thinks that government should be built around a kind of project manager model uh, run by Prince Two qualified people and, you know, as he puts in himself, weirdos. Uh, no, that's what he said he wanted to recruit. Uh, but it's important to realise what he, what, he, what he isn't. He isn't a central planner in the political sense, because what strikes me about what he's not just said today, but said for many years on his blog, is that he doesn't like politics and the political process and what it involves. And he thinks most politicians are idiots and morons. Um, he, what he is, is a technocrat. He thinks that we should have a government of technocratic experts who can run government as a series of problem-solving uh, projects. And what that assumes is that there is no real scope for disagreement about political principles, about things like ethics, what counts more in philosophy, what way of life you want to promote. Uh, all of that is irrelevant as far as he's concerned. It's all about, as I say, practical problem solving by really, really smart people. And by the way, I think that self-deprecation was a classic illustrator of false modesty. Uh, shall we say. So, uh, you know, that does not impress me. Uh, and so, yes, he is a central planner, but it's important to realise what kind of central planner he is and what Cummingsism is. It's a view which is not confined to him, by the way. It's this idea that, you know, it's the smartest people in the room who need to run it. I think this is a catastrophic idea, by the way. Uh, the last time we had the best and the brightest in charge of anything, we got the Vietnam War. And look how that works out. So that's really interesting, Steve. You think that actually Cummings is the new version of the man in Whitehall knows best. It's just that he thinks these 
men in Whitehall should be quirkier and weirder than the bowler-hatted civil yeah. servant that's perhaps the imagery from the past, right? Yeah, exactly. He thinks that his big E-Day fixe really is that we've got a government that's not right because it's full of uh, amateurs, uh, Humphrey types, who uh, are not the kind of technocratic and scientific experts like the ones he admires. And you know, say he wants to you know, bring in a team of project managers to run everything. Steve, I know you've got to go. Emma and, and Joanna, stay with us just for, for your thoughts on... Uh, Emma, am I, am I trying a bit hard to derive a political philosophy from the man that is Dom Cummings? And as I say, I, I actually quite like him. I certainly find him great entertainment value. And I know him a bit. He's not, he's not a close friend, but I've met, I've met him a good few times. Um, is there a Cummings philosophy that we can discern here? Or is he, um, as David Cameron said, just a career psychopath? No, I'm sure he does have a philosophy, whether or not we can infer what that philosophy might be. Although I'm sure if you if you wanted to go through all of his blogs, but going back all of all, for however many years he's been doing it, you might be able to glean something. Um, I do think there was a, a good uh, point there that um, he I think he almost has a sort of vision that's a bit like Plato's Philosopher Kings. Um, and I, wouldn't, I don't know if I would describe it as being uh, technocratic. Maybe it's a kind of like geekocracy that he has in mind. Um, as I mean, it's particularly, um, I don't know, a lot of people have been pointing out that he uh, made references to various films and a super, was it Superman or a Spider-Man meme? Spider-Man meme, the, uh, that's right. People uh, pointing yeah. at each other, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so maybe maybe it's his philosophy is some kind of geekocracy. I think what we could glean from that evidence session was that what he wanted to do or what he envis envis envisages as being the solution to the problems that he's identified. And I think posterity will tell us whether or not he's right about um, the, the, the various diagnoses he's made um, about the government's mistakes. But I think that um, the, what he was really hinting at is that he thinks that the solution to uh, a lot of our inaccuracies in, uh, inadequacies or the mediocrity that he perceives within Whitehall or within the civil service is to bring in people from outside with new blood, whether that is the weirdos that he was originally trying to recruit as staff or as expert advisors, that he thinks the solution to um, many of the problems, or as he called it, groupthink, is to bring more people in and get them around the table, which, to be fair, I think that's a, a relatively sensible suggestion. It's almost common sense. Um, but I don't know whether or not he, we can glean some kind of coherent political philosophy from that. Joanna, what, what do you make of it? Is this the, the Cummings theology, as Emma says, that and the geeks shall inherit the earth, to slightly misquote the Bible? Um, <laughs> what, 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 do you, what do you make of Cummings' philosophy view of the world and politics? Well, I think, I think I'd go a little bit further than either technocracy or geekocracy. Um, it smacks me as a dictatorship that he's really interested in. Um, when Cummings has a problem with politicians, I think what we can uh, read into that is actually what he has a problem with is democracy. Um, he thinks when people have a say, they get it wrong. And I think that's illustrated by his contempt for Boris Johnson. Now, you know, I'm not going to sit here and, and argue to be Boris Johnson's number one fan. I think a lot of us could be very, very critical of, of mistakes Boris Johnson's made, particularly over the course of this past year. But the fact is, he is the elected leader of this country or elected prime minister. Um, he does have a huge majority and has won by election. And I think Boris, um, I think Dominic Cummings' contempt for Boris Johnson is, is actually a contempt for democracy, he certainly comes very close to being a contempt for democracy. Um, I, I think, you know, on what Emma was saying about him wanting more people around the table, definitely get behind that. You know, I think always good to have more people around the table. My concern is that when you were saying, Mark, he, he speaks about almost dividing people up into two lists between the geniuses and the idiots. What he really means by that is the geniuses are people who agree with him and the idiots are the people who disagree with him. So you can have as many people as you like around the table, but if they're his self-selected geniuses, i.e. they're all people who agree with him and are going to tell him what he thinks, then you could have a, a huge table, but you're not going to further um, political debate one bit. I think it's really interesting um, what's emerged today is the change in the attitude of the media 
<laughs> how Boris Johnson's got, oh, sorry, I keep on saying that, Dominic Cummings has gone from being this pantomime villain dragged out for a sort of boo and hiss at uh, to now being painfully rehabilitated by the very same people who were ready to pour scorn on him a year ago uh, and now in the process of beatifying him and Barnard <laughs> Castle trips along with it you know isn't he the hero of the moment because now suddenly he seemed to be on their side really interesting uh, let me finish by asking you each uh, this question P possibly the the only moment I, di I didn't I wasn't glued to the screen for all of it but in, in which um uh, Dom Cummings sort of slightly lost his footing was when it was put to him by the chairman, I think it was Greg Clark who was chairing at the time. Um, okay, well, that, you've made a number of assertions. Can you please put all of your WhatsApp messages in the public domain then? You know, you've sort of said that you've only, you hardly spoke to any journalist, maybe Laura Kunzberg on an occasion or two. Uh, it shouldn't be any problem with you handing over your WhatsApp messages. And, and Cummings didn't say no, he didn't say yes. He sort of ummed and erred and said there are problems here. Emma, what do you make of the kind, of, and, and there were all sorts of direct quotes he was ascribing to the Prime Minister in what the Prime Minister at the time would surely have believed was a private meeting. Um, whether the Prime Minister said that or not, well, I guess he's now going to have to defend that uh, when he's rolled in front of some committee or other. But Emma, do you think this sort of level of transparency is good? I mean, I lean towards transparency. Let's get to the guts of who said what to who and who decided what, that, when, and and if the Prime Minister's chief, chief advisor thinks the health secretary's an idiot and deceived somebody, well, let's get that on the public record and we can disagree about our conclusion. But do you think, Emma, there's a danger of transparency going too far? But in today's world, you could you can barely have a conversation uh, at the higher levels of government for fear mm -hmm. that it will be front page news or in front of a select committee inquiry six weeks, eight weeks, six months down the line. Yeah, I do. I I, I think I probably somewhere uh, would pitch myself somewhere near where you're placing yourself sort of in the tension between those two things, because I do think that transparency is very important. I also think that trust is very important when it comes to the everyday functioning of government, and particularly when it's things like handing over your WhatsApp messages um, things that might be um, you know, privately exchanged that are not meant for public consumption. Um, I think probably it depends on the purpose of why you are making those things transparent. I think that is probably really what's key to it. And that is on a case by case basis. Though I do, I do think the transparency is very important. I did think it was quite funny. Um, I mean, obviously, you didn't have beads of sweat forming on his head when they asked him to uh, hand over his WhatsApp messages or whether he would. Um, but it was interesting what he'd said about the uh, the, the leakiness of uh, Cobra being like a, a sieve. Um, uh, I thought that was quite interesting. Um, so, you know, I, yes, transparency is very important, um, but I think you need to have some kind of balance. Joanna, let me finish with you. What do you think the lessons are here uh, here are for uh, how we organise our public life? You know, on the one hand, you don't want people leaking material from Cobra meetings to curry favour with journalists, and they should be punished for so doing. On the other hand, you want the public and the media in general to be able to properly hold to account um, both public officials and elected politicians uh, for what they've done, what they've said and to get to the guts of how they made that decision and whether they made it flippantly or after due consideration. What do you think we're going too far, having argued for freedom of speech and all the rest of it, but do you think there's a danger that our politics is now going too far in the direction of transparency and openness? I think it's a very interesting relationship between transparency and free speech. And I don't think the um, ability to have private conversations in any way contradicts a belief in free speech. I think it's possible to argue for both. And, and I certainly would. I think having having free speech and having transparency in some circumstances is important um but likewise you can't um you can't live your life i couldn't live my life without having private conversations i mean that's how we surely all of us work out what we think on a particular issue we need freedom to be able to experiment and you know what i actually think as well that if you are in a very high powered job like running the country should be during a pandemic you need the freedom to be able to shout out loud 
much something that you don't actually want to be on the public record to have those moments of tension, anger, frustration. We will never know for certain what went on behind closed doors. But I think if, if people have said things that they change their minds about five minutes later or don't mean to be in the public domain, I think we should be a little bit tolerant and um, forgiving about that. Um, I, I think just as a, a final point, you know, we're, we're being promised this inquiry into what's gone on, you know, the role of scientists, the role of uh, the government ministers, the role of the Department of Health, the, this kind of public inquiry. One thing I would really like to see happen, which I doubt will ever, ever happen, is an inquiry into the role of the media over the course of this past year, because I think there are some really important questions that the media should have been asking. And they have been so obsessed with this Whitehall um, part public, uh, part, part sorry, political point scoring, part just gossip. And a lot of what we've had today from Dominic Cummings, I think, has quite frankly, just being gossip. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to come across as a hypocrite. I enjoy this just as much as the next person. But uh, it's trivia. It's gossip. It's it's him settling scores. It's, it's him being bitchy about former colleagues. You know, we can all do that. We can all enjoy it. But, but that's that. What's despicable, I think, is the very people who should be holding the government to account, who should have been asking some really difficult questions over this past year. Transmission in hospital, transmission in care homes. You know, people in the media have not been asking those questions. It's far easier, far more fun. You get far more retweets if you um, send a, a snarky comment about Boris, uh, about sorry, Cummings uh, driving to Barnard Castle than if you ask a really difficult question about what was going on in our care homes. And I think they've let us all down, quite frankly. Well, on that typically downbeat note, <laughs> they're under criticism of the political elite, which is always <laughs> worth having. Joanna, Emma, thank you so much for joining us. Always a pleasure to spend time in your uh, virtual company. We have overrun our time. My apologies for that. Although you can re-watch this episode of Live with Littlewood more than six times uh, compared to the length of time it will take you to watch the entire Dom Cummings testimony. So uh, if you don't want to get into the tittle-tattle and the gossip, you just want some clear thinking, why not re-watch this six times or some of the previous episodes or some of the other great stuff on the REA London YouTube channel. Thank you to all of my guests, Emma and Joanna. It's been a pleasure having you with us. Thanks too to my earlier guests, Matt Kilcoyne, Steve Davies and Freddie Gray. It's been great to have them as well. Thanks to all of you for watching. If you're not yet a subscriber to the IEA London YouTube channel, please hit the subscribe button uh, and the notification bell. If you've enjoyed the show, please hit the thumbs up, the like button just uh, below the video screen. Um, thanks very much as well for those of you who have already signed up to be an IEA online patron through Patreon. Particular shout out to James Burns, Timothy Worrell and Mark Edwards who've signed up at the top, top rate. It's only you guys that mean that the lights are still on in this studio and I've got a working microphone. So if any of you are willing to help us stay on air, uh, then please make sure that you uh, go to the uh, IA Patreon link, which will be in the show notes and in the chat. We really appreciate your support. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, make sure that you come to our online Think conference on June the 12th. A promotional video for that will follow at the end of this program. Stay safe. Stay free. Have a good night. Over and out. Inspiring. Informative. Dynamic. Diverse. Entertaining. Liberalism. Challenging. Disruption. Futuristic. So how is politics at the moment? Well, it's a total mess. Modern economics should become humanomics. If you really want to tackle a problem, rather than thinking about things, but what you've got to do is be part of the solution. The whole point of think is to question everything you think you know. Ideas around liberty, free markets, freedom of speech. Are you left or are you right? It's not a black and white distinction anymore. I don't think anyone would disagree that we're in the midst of a free speech crisis. People that want to understand economics and how does it impact within society. You people, very few of you, will have the old school job for life. I'm an optimist and I don't think we've seen anything in terms of the progress that's coming.
I hope to make one or two people question their assumptions. Something that's going to challenge the opinion that I already have.